everyone. Welcome to Group Text. My guest today is downright hilarious. Leanne Morgan has taken her everyday experiences, a wife, mother, and I can't believe this, a very young grandmother, and spun it into comedic gold out of them. Her YouTube special, So Yummy, has over, this kills me, 50 million views. And her first Netflix special, I'm Every Woman, debuts on April 11th. She is also the host of the YouTube channel, Sweaty and Pissed, which is how I feel most days, (laughs) um, which sounds so much more like me than I care to admit, where she discusses menopause and the female midlife. Please welcome... Knoxville, Tennessee's own Leanne Morgan. Hi. Thank you, my darling. For our, thank you for a wonderful intro. Huh. Hi. Now, off the top of my head, I can't think of that many stand-ups that have come out in Knoxville. <laughs> you I think don't, I'm the only one. Yeah, Melissa. Like, it's not really the hub of, of growing stand-up talent. How did you start? Okay, Melissa, it's the craziest thing. And let me say that your mama was, I was a huge fan of your precious mama, and she uh, inspired me. And and you have too, and I've watched y'all. But anyway, and I told you when I first saw you on here, I said, it's like seeing Elvis. <laughs> okay. Okay, but I I'm hope gonna... not the fat and bloated part. <laughs> no, the thin, the thin young one that felt good. And... Okay. All right, so I, I met, I went to the University of Tennessee. I always wanted to be a comedian, but I, I'm from a town of 500 people, farming community, and I just didn't know. It, it, I could have never had the guts to say, I'm going to L.A. at 18 to try to make it, or New York. So I went the traditional route, and I was scared of everything, and I went to college, and I didn't want to go, and I flailed around and made horrible decisions and did terrible things in the 80s, dated people you wouldn't wipe your feet on. Okay, then I ended up finishing through the grace of God. I met my husband, Chuck Morgan. He moved me to Bean Station, Tennessee, in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. I got pregnant with my first baby, who is now 29 years old, and my boy. I've got a boy and two girls, and I wanted to stay home with him and nurse and be a stay-at-home mom, still with this dream that I want to go to Hollywood. But I didn't know when, I didn't know how. And one of my good friends was selling jewelry like women sell Tupperware and Mary Kay. And she said, Lynn, you could do this. You love people. You could eat day up. You'll make a little money. And, you know, to get your hair highlighted. I started doing jewelry shows in women's homes. Made people laugh. Somebody peed on the couch one night. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I, that was a God moment for me. I thought, I can make it. I can make it. So then I, my, the company noticed I was booking so far in advance. They asked me to start speaking at big things. Women said, you need to be a stand-up. I felt, you know, like I could do it. Then my husband sold his business. We moved to San Antonio, Texas, where there was a comedy club. First time I was around the comedy club, and I did open mic, and then it went from there. So I've been doing this since my baby child was 18 months old. She's now 25. So I think people thought I was like a YouTuber. When this blew up, I thought, I, I, I think, you know, people didn't know who I was, but I've been doing comedy for over 20 years. And, and this just blew up and I, in 2019, and I'm 57 years old. I've got a grandbaby. Okay, first of all, two questions. One is how are you coping with everyone saying, over, you know, overnight success? And you're like, no, I am a 20-year overnight success and what do you remember what you said that made someone pee on the couch um i think i you know i could ask carmen her name is carmen that peed on that couch and she now works at my eye doctor and i see her all the time tell her honey you changed my life and she goes i'm so glad okay but i i I know that i was supposed to be talking about how a clip earring could change the look of your pump and instead, because I really don't care about jewelry, but I, instead I was talking about, oh my gosh, I've got a hemorrhoid. I'm, you know, talk, I was talking about breastfeeding. I was talking about resenting my husband because he didn't help me with that baby and would get up in the night. Never heard the baby. You know, I, I was talking about what was going on in my 
life. So it was something about birthing, I'm sure, because I was in the middle of being pregnant, breastfeeding. I had another baby soon after that. So it was probably talking about my body, my doings, like, I don't know, leaking me. I don't know. And that GTD on that couch, because I'm, I'm very, I've always been very open. And my sister's very introverted. And she's older than me. And she's always said, shut your mouth. Why do you tell everybody that? But I've just been open. And I, anyway, I was telling something probably horrible happening to my body. She peed on the couch. And then what was the other question, sweet Melissa? Because I'm, I'm in brain fog from menopause. That, that's okay. I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking that you're talking about what you were actually going through in the moment was very much what my mother did. And I think, um, isn't it amazing that that resonates that you sometimes have to be the brave one in the room to talk about these things? Thank you for saying that. And yes, and this is what I hear all the time. People say to me, oh my gosh, you say what we're thinking and we can't say because um, the other question, what were you were saying about, about is it being inter- 20 that all of a sudden everyone's like, you're an overnight success. You're like, honey, no, you just finally caught up. Yes. And it, and I really got paranoid when this, when this happened for me and I got my first hundred city tour called the big panty tour. I got real self-conscious and thought I've never been a cool kid in the cafeteria in LA and New York and you know, I've never played the comedy store. I went there as a patron. I, you know, they wouldn't let me come and and do stand up, and I, you know, my manager at the time never could get me yet. And I, 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 re, I did. I was paranoid. I thought people thought, oh, she's just one of these people that just sparks on YouTube, does a video in her bedroom or something. And I really, and it, I didn't want that because I have worked like a dog, and I have, I have been out in the road. I've done terrible gigs. I've, you know, grinded this out for twenty something years. So I really, it was important for me to get that across to people. And now I'm like, you know what, whatever, if they think that, I don't care. I mean, now I've gotten, I'm okay. But yes, it would, that would, that, I did think that. And all, now, y'all, and over the years, when I could barely get arrested, women would say to me, you're so relatable. That's my daughter. That's my son. That's my husband. That is my stomach. But I have failed at Weight Watchers nine times. I mean, so, and that is a blessing to me that people say that to me. They go, oh, my gosh, you say what well, we're feeling. And I that is exactly my life. We could live. We are living parallel lives. Have you ever thought about calling Oprah and asking for money back since you failed Weight Watchers nine times? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yes. And what? And the last three times I joined is because I saw a like, commercial of her twirling pasta and running thin tall grass. <laughs> And that's exactly why I did it. I thought, if Oprah can do it, I can do it. Well, you'd need a refund. Um, You are (laughs) such a natural storyteller. Were you, I mean, obviously when you were doing the sales, you you were that way. Were you always funny? Were you the funny one in your family or is everyone funny? Does, you know, did you have an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent who knew how to tell a great story? I had a lot of people in my life. My little daddy, who's 83 years old, is a wonderful storyteller. My mama, Lucille, who's about to turn 80, is a dance work, Melissa. She's got something. Like, I think she could have gone to Hollywood. And she's one of those people that, if we did go to a Tupperware party when we were, when I was little and she was, you know, smoking and drinking tab, she could, she could take the room. And everybody loved her. And what she still can. She goes to the senior citizens and plays cards. And she kills every day. Everybody loves her. And my grandmother was funny, but we always, it was a lot of humor around. And every, you know, even if something was bad, we used humor to get over it. And then I went to a little bitty country school, kindergarten through 12. And I had wonderful teachers that I think saw something in me. And they go, Lynn's a ham, let her MC the whatever, or let's let Leanne get up and do the, you know, so they, they would encourage me. And I was in a rural area outside of Nashville, Tennessee, on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. And and this is crazy, but I had somebody in my class, I only graduated with 42 people, and I had a boy in my class who went on to Juilliard and is an actor and has been on several things. So we there was some, there was a lot of talent in our class, and I had like little speech and drama, but I still was so 
isolated. I just didn't know, you know, I, I would watch you all on TV or your mom. I mean, you're younger than me, I think. But as y'all were doing entertainment, when y'all were doing the shows and the red carpet and all that, I mean, I just dreamed of that. But I just didn't know how to get there, what to do. It never dawned on me. Pack up everything. And now, after I had my babies and I got a little bit of success, I said to my husband, let's sell everything. Let me move. To, let's move to LA. I'll, I'll cook all the hot plate. And he was like, are you crazy? We need health insurance. And, I, and he was right, Melissa. It was just not the right time. So you started posting videos on YouTube and then you end up doing basically a special on YouTube. When you put it up, I mean, you had to have already had a fan base because you were already touring, correct? No. Oh, so the special came before touring. Okay. At which point did you say, I can't believe this is blowing up a hundred thousand, a million, 10 million, 50 million is like an obscene number. Well, and let me tell you, that was on Drive Bar, which is a a platform online. I had I did I did not have social media people. I was putting up pictures of my dogs. I I was just flailing around. I had horrible gigs. I was not really my career was not going well. And Drive Bar comedy had started, but nobody knew what it was. And it was out of Salt Lake City, and they asked me if I wanted to do a special and. My manager at the time said, nobody will ever see it. Nobody's heard of it. Go on and do it, Leanne. They're going to pay you a couple of thousand dollars. So I, on a fluke, flew out there, got a spray tan, <laughs> and and bought a pair of Ann Taylor Loft jeans with kid crop. And I did that special thing, and nobody's going to see this, and maybe I can use the clips to get other pitiful gigs. And I had no idea that thing was going to go like that. And it, it really built me... I got a fan base, but I wasn't selling tickets. It wasn't until I hired these two little guys to do my social media. I was watching Jim Gaffigan, like people that I admired, that I, I work in big theaters and what I wanted to do. I started watching their social media, and I, I said to my manager, they're doing, they've are doing. they got somebody doing this. They're do, And I don't, I need somebody. And he was like, you can't afford that. And I just made the decision myself, and I hired these young guys that knew how to do it, and that's when it blew up. That's when it translated into ticket sales and people. And I tell you what it was. It was a clip about me taking my husband to go see Dev Leopard and Journey and how everybody at that concert had gotten older and everybody looked sick and people had plantar fasciitis walking out of there. <laughs> it that went viral. And then I think people watched that and then thought, what else does she do? Then they found the drive bar special. It made it go higher. And I think, Liz, I don't mean to get so philosophical, but I think that I, I just hit a niche that was of people that were being ignored, that nobody was speaking to. And it, and this thing blew up, and I I am as in shock as anybody. I'm not in shock that it, because I believe in myself, right. but I thought, oh, I'm going to be a sitcom star. And I've had television deals, and they haven't made it like four deals in Hollywood. And then, you know, and now I'm very cynical about all that. But I thought, oh, I'm going to be, I want to be Roseanne, Ray Romano. That was my dream, you know, coming up in comedy at my age. And then, but this that's happened is so much sweeter and better than anything I could have imagined. Because I'm in theaters, 2,500 seats. Now I'm doing some small arenas. I mean, that's, that's in. I mean, you have to look back and go, in the last five years, what the hell happened? How are your kids handling it? Have they, I mean, you have to have said some stuff, and I speak from experience, where they've gone like, oh my God, mom, I can't believe you talk about that. Or I can't believe you say that. When did that begin to happen? Okay, that happened when they were in middle school. And that was a very <laughs> dry time for me. And they said, do not say my name. And it was like, like Will Smith and Jada. I mean, they were like, don't you? And I was scared that I didn't want that. You know, middle school is a horrible time for children anyway. And I did not want to ever make them feel weird. So I've always, you know, said, is this okay? Is this okay? But middle school, they were like, do not talk about me. And then in high school, they were like, we don't care what you do. And really, Melissa, my career, I mean, I was having Hollywood, you know, deals, but nothing was happening. So it really wasn't 
And when I when like people interview my kids, they go, you know, yeah, we knew Mama was a comedian, and it was, you know, there were Nick and I came to our house one time, but she was our mom. More than anything, she she picked us up at school every day. I mean, she was our mama before anything. And so it's not till this has happened that they are all going, what in the world? And the and I've got a I'm writing a book that's just funny essays, but the name of it is What in the World? Because you're right, every day I go, What in the world? And this is just so exciting, but it's messed with my head. There for a little while I really had imposter yeah, how did it mess with your head? Did you become too self-critical? Did you become yes. uh, too wrapped up in the I'm right and you're wrong? I mean, stuff really does ebb and flow. Where do you, where, where, did, what was the first thing? Like panic and then an ego boost and then having to bring yourself back down to earth? Was it, you know, what's the, what was that like? It, I couldn't believe it was happening, but yet it felt right. Like it felt, because I knew as a child, like I felt as a child, this was going to, I was going to be an entertainer. But then there were times over the years that I'd think, am I crazy? Am I like these American Idol people that think they can sing? <laughs> like, you know, I went through, am I delusional? And then I'm good. I'm talented. I've got it. And then am I crazy? Well, then when this all happened to me and, it, and I started selling out all over the country and doing clubs first before I got the big first big tour, I really... I could thought, oh no, I'm not, maybe I can't do this. Maybe I'm not, I really can't never think I can do it. And I can't do it. And, I, and also people had seen all my material online, my social media people blow through it. So I had to come up with a new hour and that intimidated me. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's not going to be as good. Cause it took me 10 years to come up with that first 45 minutes. So that went through my head. And then I thought, this is what has been so precious, but also made me feel like maybe I'm not worthy of this. Pete, women would come up to me and say in comedy clubs, you got me through chemo. Uh, my husband passed away. I've been watching your videos and you don't know how you've gotten me through that. And that was hard for me because I thought I'm not worthy of them. I, and I need to go home and make them a casserole. I need to go to their house and clean their house. I mean, I, it was all kinds of just weird things. And then I'm doing better with that. Because I think, you know, I can't be everything to everybody, but it's so sweet, the things they say to me. But I did. I went through a terrible thing of, I'm an imposter. I can't do this. And then I can't carry this burden. And what are they, you know, pandemic hit. Then people were saying, you got me through the pandemic. And that makes me feel good. Because I know I was on the back porch with no makeup on saying, this is what I'm cooking for my little mama. This is what I'm doing for my grandbaby. And I know that people connected with that. And I and felt like I was their good friend. So that was, I was able to deal with that. But all this stuff, like going to L.A., I'm out in L.A. and I'm doing press. And I still walk in like, and I'm like, uh, 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 and look at the Hollywood people. But I also think, Melissa, the blessing, I know I talk about your head off. The blessing is, I'm 57. If this had happened to me at 40, I probably would have, you know, trying to put on, I don't know. Now, I'm like, I'm 57. I'm a grandma. This is who I am. You got to, I mean, I, I just got to be who I am. And I, and that's all I can do. You know, I'm in menopause. I'm too tired. I don't sleep at night. <laughs> I'm I too tired. Well, hence, I was going to say sweaty and pissed. Sweaty and pissed. I can't put on and be somebody I'm not. And I think that comes with wisdom and you know i'm glad if this has happened to me it happened at this time in my life i think it could not have been better time and my children are grown they don't need me like they did you know if i'd have gotten that television deal i look back on it if i would have gotten the sitcom with abc and they had you know i thought i was gonna make it and then it got canceled or something i would have uprooted my family i mean i got to raise my children and keep my foot in comedy and then they'll I can enjoy this and not feel burdened that I have to leave little children. Which is which is great. So you, you're you talking about doing a, a, a hundred dates a year, which, I mean, and I've talked about this with other comedians. I know this from firsthand experience. Being a woman on the road is hard. It's harder than it is for the men. So my mother always had, and most comedians had this rituals. 
She would go into the hotel room. She would automatically turn on like law and order or forensic files because that's what made her feel at home. Yes, I understand that is strange that solving murders and forensic files made my mother feel no, that my cozy. <laughs> you know, it does me too, which is really even stranger. What is your road ritual? Like, what do you do? My mother also used to go into hotel rooms and rearrange furniture. More to her she liking. Did. Yeah. That doll. What a worker. I think she had a no, lot more No, that wasn't energy. being a worker. That was just very, you know, neurotic. <laughs> I don't like the, the way this is organized. I'm reorganizing the room. <laughs> I don't do that. I do go in and I get everything out and I hang up my dresses because I wear dresses on stage so that they can, you know, get the wrinkles out, spread a little downy wrinkle release. And I um, I do get my chargers out and I get all that and I, I do rest. I get up and I, now I, did, I was trying to go straight and go to the workout room because I, I know that that's going to help build my stamina, but oh my Lord, then most of the time I have been doing well lately. I'm so tired by the time I get there. I, doing comedy, and you know, when you got to be on, it's not physical, but it's mental. And I feel like I need to lay in the bed, put my feet up. I don't necessarily go to sleep. I just need to get my head right and just rest and relax, you know, like, People go and see museums and do all that stuff on the road. I can't do that. I don't have the, I don't have the stamina. I have to preserve myself to go and then do sound check, and then I come alive during the show, and then it takes me a while to get back down, which now makes me. I've now realized why Loretta Lynn got on pills. I mean, <laughs> it, hell. How are you supposed to, I, I eat melatonin in the thinner so that it can try to, you know, get me relaxed, take my magnesium. I tell you what I'm doing. I'm taking a bunch of probiotics. I get all my pills out. I got a, a big thing of supplements from my hormone doctor. I do that kind of stuff. I do like to look at my phone, see if, if my daughter-in-law put anything up with my grandbaby. Uh -huh. I do check with everybody. You're, I'm alive. I got here. You know, I tell my girls, my daughters call me and check on me. You know, my son is precious and I'm in love with him, but he's working and got a family. He can't call and be up my butt, but my girls are. Was he ever good at calling? Because um, my 22-year-old only in initiates a call if there's something that needs to be dealt with. He will... Yes. Answer Charlie. and he'll respond to a text, but only when I see my phone ring and it's him, my first thought is, What is wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charlie did that when he went to college. We barely heard from him, we would have to call him, and um, it, he would call, yeah, if he needed like money in his account or a tire, yeah, or something, you know. But um, but precious though, mine is too, but he just had to learn how to make an appointment to get his car serviced and deal with that and picking it up and dropping it off and finding out what's wrong. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah. you know, that was a couple phone calls home. Yeah, yeah. What are boys yummy? There's something about a boy that is so yummy. A boy and their mom. Their boy and their mom. Now, and do you like your daughter-in-law? I love her. I love her. And I and it, I had a hard time with it at first, not her personally, but he wanted to get married. He met her when he was 19 in college, and he came home and said, she's the love of my life, my best friend, this is it. This is the one I'm going to marry. We're going to get married right out of school. And he always said, I won't get married till I'm in my 30s. I want to go overseas. He had studied in Ireland, and I just, that threw me. But I always loved her. And let me tell you, she's got grit. This is what you need to pray for. You got, you want a daughter-in-law that's got some sense and can, you know, is independent and can take care of herself. And it's not somebody that has been pampered all over life because your boy's going to have to tend to her. So I'm, my daughter-in-law, they are a team. They both were, she just got her MBA. Wow. She's pregnant with second grandbaby. She is, I put her up against anybody and she loves him. And, and she's a good mom and a good um, wife. 
But when they when they first told me they were going to do this, I had a hard time. And I also knew Melissa because I'm um, a Southern Christian woman. I knew that he was going to claim to his wife that that's biblical. And I had a hard. I thought, Oh my Lord, he's not going to be mine anymore, you know. And then and then I felt like I was twisted, and I thought I got to let him go. And but the wonderful thing is they're. I mean they're close to me, and I'm close to her. And I, they've got these babies for me. It's the best. Of- I think I'm going to be a, I'm going to try and be a good mother-in-law. There is no, <laughs> I am not making any promises. As long as she's cool with moving into my house, because I assume they'll still <laughs> live with me. And as I have said to Cooper, any of grandma's china or jewelry or silver that goes with you is only on a, le- a lending program. If, if you leave the jeweler, grandma's ring leaves with you. Like, that's the deal. <laughs> yes, you want them to live with you. I wanted Charlie and Mary to, I beg them all the time still. Do y'all want to like redo your house and move in with us? We've got a full nursery. I get it. But I always, if I buy my girl something, I buy Mary something. Like she's at the end of her pregnancy now. And I sent her two nice dresses that she would have for spring. So I, I love her and I make over her. And so she's like another child to me. So I, I suggest you do that because you want to be around them. So you need to suck up to them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> you know, right now I still buy his clothes. So I'm all good with that. Um, yes, I know you are. So one day your agent calls you and says, guess what? Netflix wants to do a special. What was that moment? Oh, Melissa, I um, it took me a long time to process it because I really and truly, and I'm a big dreamer, but I had it in my head. I've kind of got a chip on my shoulder about not being in L.A. and New York. I thought they're never going to want a middle-aged woman from Tennessee uh, you know, there was nobody like ne- on Netflix like me. And I think that's why they wanted me. But it really was hard for me to accept it. And I, I mean, I was thrilled, thrilled. And I've got the best agent in the world and, and the best manager now. I, um, they're wonderful. You know that you've said that now on tape. So when you go to sue them 10 years from now, <laughs> this can be evidence. <laughs> Oops. My um, bad. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, but I, um, I was, I was, I couldn't believe it. I thought I just had it in my head. Oh, you know, I'm older. I'm this, I'm that. I'm not what they want and all that. I really didn't think, and I'm just so thankful that they did. And they've been wonderful to me. And I'm just, I cannot believe it's coming out and this has happened. And it, I think it looks beautiful. I do think I could have lost weight. Yeah. I could have lost weight. My breasts are too fat in it, Melissa, but (laughs) But I am proud of it. I hope people like it. Now, you know, I'm getting paranoid. You know how comedians are. We're so, everything's in our head. I think, is anybody going to like it? You know, now I'm going through that. But it comes out next, you know, April the 11th. And I'm, and I'm excited. And it's just thrilling. And now I'm on a new tour called the Just Getting Started Tour. Hunter Cities again. A new Hunter City Tour. In my, and it's all new material. And I called it the Just Getting Started Tour because I feel like I'm just getting started at 57 with a grandbaby. And I want people to know without getting too sappy. You know, if you love something and you keep going, good things will happen. Now, people don't necessarily want to do what I'm doing. But, you know, it pays off after a while that dreams do come true, you know. And and I do think, I also think now, listen, you know this because you're big time. But. Like, Jamie Lee Curtis winning that Oscar. Like, there's more and more of, they're realizing that women are not, it's not over for women at 40, at 50, at 60, you know? Well, like, look at her precious mama. Well, what I always look at, which I find fascinating whenever I watch a red carpet, that all the women that are still the ones we wait for, fashion-wise, are all either 48 and older, but most of them are 50 and over. And I think that's a fascinating shift in how we view women. You know, I wonderful now that I've gone down some weird academic hole. Okay, you talk about <laughs> all new material. Okay, so you've got a lot of material online. 
You've got the Netflix special. What is your process? I mean, my mother worked out in a club at least once a week, constantly trying new material. People don't realize, like, you've got a all new material for a 100-city tour. Also, I have to ask, to go on the road for a 100-city tour, is there anything wanna, you want to tell us? Are you, you having, you know, do you just not like your husband anymore and it's just easier <laughs> to be away? You know? Well, well, he drives me like a mule. He wants me to make this money. He's worked like a dog all of our lives and 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 provided for us. It That is getting kind of, because he'll say, like, this last week, he goes, where are you going? And I go, because it's so hard to keep up with. I go, because he's running a division of a company. He's got a big job, a lot of stress. And I said, I'm going to Columbus, Georgia, making it, and then I'll be in L.A., but I'm coming back Thursday. He goes, you're not coming back until Thursday. And I thought, we have got to get a big calendar or something. I do go home and think, oh, my gosh, I've got to put on cute panties and do, you know, unspeakable things. Because he... That's why how he shows love. Oh God, they're so and basic. They're they so are, basic. You know, they really are. They don't need much. If I just have something, you know, I like to cook. If I cook a little something and do it, you know, that's all he needs from me. But so it is hard that we're trying to manage that because I am called, and he's used to me being at home. I would do comedy on the weekends, and you know, he would be with the kids back then, but not like this, not every weekend and all that but he's also thinking because he's not in show business this could end tomorrow and don't buy anything so i can't you know i'm i do buy a good frank and eileen then i'm sure that once in a while for my sale but i have not made any big purchases and he's making me save everything so um oh but what were we saying what i'm sorry i was just joking i'm like you know it's kind of sometimes, sometimes it, uh, you've been married so long. Maybe it's saving, you know, keeping the marriage fresh. Maybe because, yeah, it, you know, he sits and stares out into space and he's talked all day and he's very introverted and doesn't have, have words. And this kind of keeps me, I mean, I'm out and about with people and I kind of get that. I'm a people person. And then I can go home and, you know, make out with him <laughs> and do all that. And then we get the grandbaby. We both got car seats in our car. Um, and we're enjoying that baby together. But my husband will go with me if I'm going to the win or somewhere like that. If he can play blackjack or play golf, he'll go. If it's somewhere nifty. But you're right. I have to do, I have to make extra time for him because I do think he feels a little neglected. But he's happy for all this. By the way, nothing that a nice cashmere sweater. And you in in panties and a bra from somewhere can't fix. You're right. <laughs> They're all right. It's so easy. Okay, so the Netflix special, April 11th. Can't wait. Where can we find your tour dates? LeeAnnMorgan.com. And it's 100 cities. Yes, girl, it's going to kill me, probably. But I really do. I, I'm having a ball, but it's hard. That travel at my age, and and I used, I was trying to do it kind of, you know, on the cheap way. Like, I'm, you know, uh, yanking my own suitcases and all that. I may have to have some help. I may have to hire somebody to help me on the second one because it I, it gets to be a lot, you know. Then then I'm putting biofreeze on my neck and... So I'm, I'm, and I need to exercise and take better care of myself. I realize that now that, it, that you really got to train like you're an Olympian to do this. Yeah, you do. And by the way, I think you've earned someone to go on the road with you. Lisa, thank you. Girl. I received that. Yeah. Save that too, because that way you can run that back to your husband and say, she knows she, she grew up in this. She is an expert. <laughs> you are. You are. Leanne Morgan, thank you so much. Thank you.